Today we'll be traveling back to 1830s America, just 50 years after the birth of a new nation called the United States of America. Now the US has always had its ups and downs throughout history and isn't exactly known to have the cleanest track record out there. Undeniably one of America's largest downs came in the form of the brutal force for settlement of the Native American tribes of the Southeast. Hi, I'm Isaac with Intrusivity, and in today's video we'll be talking about the Trail of Tears. So the early white settlers of America aren't necessarily known for their peaceful coexistence and good treatment of the local indigenous population. It's too bad really that that Thanksgiving thing we had going didn't really work out. The vast majority of colonists throughout the 17th and 18th century shared the common European perspective of the time that the native populations living in the areas that the Europeans had settled were savages and practiced inferior cultures. And since the unchristian, barbaric, indigenous population of the Americas perfectly fit this narrative, they were fit to be exploited and discriminated against by the early English, but also French and Spanish colonists. This and the fact that the settlers brought deadly and highly infectious diseases severely reduced the Native American population. By the mid-18th century, the Native American tribes were in many cases desperate for help against encroaching settlers who kept pushing Indian settlements further to the west over the Appalachian mountain chain. And so, a few of the tribes settling in the Northeast and Midwest aided the French fight against the British colonists in the North American offshoot of the Seven Years' War of Europe, often referred to as the French and Indian War. Now, France, along with the Native Americans, lost the war. But just 12 years later, in 1775, the indigenous tribes found a new, unlikely ally in their former enemy, Britain. If you know a bit about American history, you might recall that things weren't exactly looking too great for the British Empire and its colonial possessions in North America during the 1770s. Britain's original 13 colonies on the East Coast had decided to throw off their chains and had started a rebellion against its master on the other side of the Atlantic. Both the British and Americans appealed to the tribes, but in the end, most Native Americans along the frontier decided to aid the British in order to combat American settlement and influence. Unfortunately, the 13 rebelling colonies won the war and went on to form the sovereign United States of America, with all lands east of the Mississippi firmly in its jurisdiction. Arguably, though, the greatest loser here wasn't Britain, but the Native Americans whether they had fought with the 13 colonies or against them, with no one besides the weakened Native Americans to stop the flow of American settlers pushing the frontier west, many tribes, and primarily those of the northeast, such as the Iroquois, either were completely eradicated or were coerced into selling pretty much all of their lands to the federal government, which would then distribute it to settlers. But not all forces in the American government were working to explicitly wipe out Native Americans as a whole. Early presidents George Washington and Thomas Jefferson believed that American Indians could peacefully work together with the white colonists and possibly even integrate into American society through a process named acculturation. Here Native Americans were encouraged to give up their traditional customs for more European societal concepts. This included a lifestyle revolving around materialism, like possessing individual property rather than a collective use of land, as well as embracing Christianity as their sole religion. Subsequently many tribes, primarily the still intact frontier tribes of the Old Southwest, or what we would today call the Southeast, did adapt to this new approach. And some even practiced the most American custom of all at the time, slavery. In the following years, these Southeastern tribes of the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Creek, and Seminoles were even dubbed the five civilized tribes because of their rigorous acceptance of the American culture. And since that's exactly what America wanted, it left those tribes alone, and that explains the large Native American population nowadays living in the Southeast. Only that's not exactly what happened. However, these five civilized tribes did get treated slightly better than their northeastern counterparts. Whereas there, in many places Native Americans had completely ceased to exist, American Indians in the southeast were able to keep large reservations guaranteed by various treaties with the U.S. government, on which they could create their own sovereign governments. But soon many new states in the southeast, which had been established in the recent move of many white settlers to the west, became disenchanted by the large Indian presence in the region, especially since this was during the upstart of the infamous Cotton Kingdom, where large slave-driven cotton plantations were emerging throughout the southeast. Many plantation owners desired the land that Native American tribes occupied, and so they turned to the state and federal governments to aid their cause. And this is where the story of the Trail of Tears begins. Plans surrounding a mass Indian removal had been existing all the way back in 1803, when President Jefferson, himself an admirer of tribal culture, argued that if the Native Americans continued living on land subject to white settlements, it would eventually lead to unwanted conflict between such, and would thus inadvertently result in the demise of American Indians. He proposed a plan to move all Native Americans east of the Mississippi to federal territory west of the Mississippi, where they would forever live in harmony. At that time, no one believed that settlers would be able to settle further than the Mississippi in any conceivable future. By 1817, Congress fully supported such a plan, and thus introduced the acre-for-acre acre incentive for the large numbers of Native Americans living in the southeast. 
Native American individuals could voluntarily give up their land in their old reservations to be reimbursed with the same amount of territory on the other side of the Mississippi in the designated Indian Territory of modern-day Oklahoma. Soon, however, many tribal governments condemned this practice and placed harsh consequences going as far as public hanging on anyone trying to sell land on the reservation to the federal government. And so, only few moved west. The U.S. government was increasingly irritated by this, and in 1828 there came a shift in American policy. And this guy right here has a lot to do with that. This is Andrew Jackson. He became the seventh president of the United States as arguably the first fully democratically elected president in American history. He was probably also the first truly populous president as well. Sorry, Mr. Trump, I guess you can't be first at everything. Anyways, Jackson had always been pro-removal, since he believed Native Americans were simply incompatible with American society. Additionally, Jackson had before becoming president risen to fame as a military general in the fight against the southeastern tribe of the Seminoles in the late 18-teens. So I guess you could say he wasn't going to exactly be the kind of president to stand up for Native American interests. Did you know that President Jackson's failed economic and banking policies actually led to the first disastrous American recession back in 1837? It's kind of ironic that he still earned a place on the $20 bill for that. So by 1829, both the executive and legislative branches of the government began a more aggressive approach to the Native American problem. And this came combined with the fact that in the same year gold had been found near and in the Cherokee reservations of Georgia, which subsequently led to the Georgia Gold Rush. So the state government there was extremely intent on finally getting that sweet Native American land. For one, this led Congress to pass the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which officially granted President Jackson the power to trade the territory of Native Americans east of the Mississippi for land in Oklahoma. This still, however, could only happen with particular tribe's consent, even though Congress really didn't take that part of the bill seriously. The act also stated that the Indian Territory of Oklahoma would forever remain an Indian reservation. Ha, Congress, you sure keep your promises. The state of Georgia wasn't completely satisfied yet, though, since the move west was still only voluntary for Native American tribes, and so the Cherokee were just like, no way, we aren't going to go out west. And so Georgia did what southern states are best at, and just created laws institutionalizing discrimination and racism against Native Americans. The Cherokee of Georgia were obviously not pleased by this, and so they went to the Supreme Court to ask for help against the Georgians. Simply stated, their defense was that Georgia did not have the right to impose these unjust laws on them, since they argued they were their own sovereign state within Georgia's borders, and therefore, according to the Constitution, Georgia's laws didn't count for them. Now, the Supreme Court hasn't always been as progressive and friendly to minority groups as today, and so the case of Cherokee Nation versus the state of Georgia was struck down by the words of Justice Johnson. The Indians are nothing more than wandering hordes, held together by blood and habit, and having neither rules nor government beyond what is required in a savage state. Hmm. Well, this wasn't quite true, since the Cherokee did have a functioning council with its own laws, and so a year later the Supreme Court revoked its earlier decision and granted the Cherokee the injunction. Technically, this wouldn't have only rescinded Georgia's discriminatory laws, it would have also made the entire Indian Removal Act unconstitutional, since it infringed on the rights of a sovereign nation. It would have, at least. The Supreme Court response cleverly didn't call for Jackson to enforce any of the ruling. It simply only stated what the opinions of the judges were. Judging by Jackson's outspoken character, they knew he probably would have gone ahead with his plan of removing Native Americans no matter what the Supreme Court decision would have been. So the judges were basically just trying to avoid conflict between the executive and judiciary branches. At this point, there was no one in Jackson's way to stop him from implementing his vision of an Indian free America. Well, besides about, like, the half of Congress which voted against the Indian Removal Act and the countless intellectual Native Americans who kept writing letters to Congress imploring them to revise their decision. But let's forget about them. You may remember that the move west was still officially voluntary for Indian tribes and that the Native Americans had to agree to a treaty before they could be expelled forever into the great nothingness between Texas and Kansas, a.k.a. Oklahoma. In the cases of the Chickasaw and Choctaw, the tribal council did accede to Jackson's demands since they had either been bribed to do so, or they were just overrun by the sheer amount of illegal settlers who were supported by the government to occupy Native American lands. The Creek, who had been severely decimated in previous wars with the U.S. settlers, also eventually agreed to the move, yet many also remained on their former reservations in eastern Alabama illegally. But the Cherokee and Seminoles did not comply to Jackson's call for resettlement. So what Jackson did is he had his official sign treaties with only the tiny minority of tribal leaders who were in favor of the removal and who had acted behind the back of the majority of leaders who opposed such. The federal government, however, still viewed these contracts as legitimate, and were absolutely enraged when only few Cherokees and Seminoles set out to journey west. The Cherokee were eventually forced to move in the late summer and winter of 1838 
under President Jackson's successor Martin Van Buren, who definitely is the president with the best beard in American history. Anyways, disease, malnutrition, and exposure inflicted high numbers of casualties on the travelers, and an estimated one-fourth of all Cherokee died during the relocation, and later led the Cherokee to give this event its infamous name of the Trail of Tears. The Seminole of Florida continued to resist resettlement efforts for approximately another 20 years, and started the longest, costliest, and deadliest Indian War the United States ever fought. By 1840, there were almost no Native Americans still living east of the Mississippi. And of the 60,000 Native Americans who had been supposed to be relocated to Oklahoma, over 12,000 died on the way there. The Trail of Tears had an enormous impact on the Native American community with effects which can still be felt today and acts as a paradigm of U.S. government treatment of American Indians in the 19th century. Throughout the 19th century, Congress took up the act of removing Native Americans on a much smaller scale again and again after the original Trail of Tears. Many American Indian tribes living in the Midwest and Southwest were also relocated to Oklahoma when white settlers finally crossed the Mississippi in the latter part of the century. So in a sense, the Trail of Tears gave the U.S. government the precedence it needed for an aggressive approach to settling Native American lands. The Trail of Tears also caused a large amount of internal strife within Native American society, with many people seeking revenge on the tribal leaders which had, in their eyes, sold them out. It also led the American Indians, which had been forced to move to Oklahoma, to build up hate towards the U.S. federal government, and thus many aligned with the Southern Confederacy in their fight against the Union during the Civil War. When the Indians lost along with the South in 1865, the U.S. used this as an excuse to demand much of the Indian territory as war reparation costs. Oklahoma was finally admitted as a state in 1907 after being completely overrun by white settlers, thus officially ending the existence of the Indian Territory, which Congress had promised to the American Indians to be forever theirs just 70 years earlier. Native Americans continue to live in Oklahoma up to this day and comprise a significant population there. Thanks for watching Interestivity and join us next time as we talk about the Khmer Rouge of Cambodia. Thanks for watching Interestivity. Drop those likes like bombs over back, Dad. You can watch our past videos somewhere around here. I don't know where they are. Somewhere. Like right here maybe? Or, or there? See you next time.